Now, my guest tonight is a comedian and podcast pioneer. Richard Herring rose to fame as part of the acclaimed comedy duo Lee and Herring. He then went solo with two decades of sellout tours, including Talking Cock and Christ on a Bike. But the more I read of the New Testament without being arrogant, the more I saw that I was Jesus' equal and better. <laughs> Before launching his smash hit Leicester Square Theatre podcast, where he interviews the biggest names in comedy. And now he brings us his new book, The Problem With Men. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Richard Herring! Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's kind of weird to see you and not... because we normally touch. I know, we're very tactile. Yeah, it's kind of odd. Uh, when the vaccine's out, you're the first person I'm coming to see. Well, that's <laughs> haunting. <laughs> um, what are you looking forward to? Have you got, like, a specific thing? Uh, oh, you know, it's just getting back into theatres again, isn't it? It's, yeah, mate. It's been so sort of... I've been, I've been doing everything online and it's been fine and it's been lovely and lots of good stuff's come out of it, but it's just not the same doing, doing the, the podcast. But I thought to no of audience. you, because of all the people I know, I think you're probably best suited to being on your own. And let me explain that. <laughs> because I don't know anyone else that plays snooker with themselves there. and has a podcast where they play snooker with themselves. Well, a lot of the things I'm doing in lockdown feel like they've been invented for lockdown, yeah. but they haven't. Isn't it weird? <laughs> yeah. So I play snooker against myself and now I've been doing tournaments with 40 versions of myself playing against each other. The I, I move stones off a of field. Yeah. Um, I've started doing a ventriloquist show with me and puppets. Why have you done that? Because it's very exciting. I'm very excited. I've got a 128-year-old ventriloquist dummy that my great-granddad made. Right. And I used to use it as a student and I kind of thought, Oh, let's give it a go. I've got a Twitch channel. I thought, let's give this a go, see if I can do it. Yeah. And I'm a bit better than I thought. It doesn't matter, because it can be bad anyway. Yeah. But then I've just created all these crazy characters out of dead wasps and Marmite lids and all sorts of... I haven't gone mad. Oh, I beg to differ, I haven't mate. gone mad. You're doing a ventriloquist act <laughs> with your dead great-great-granddad's doll and there's a wasp. Yeah. We've actually got a still of your puppet. Ooh. Let's have a look-see. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Christ. Pretty good, isn't it? I mean, I mean, which one's which? Yeah. That was deep in the heart of lockdown. You can tell from the hair. I mean, its eyes are like mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he has this sort of, like, the red cheeks of you at the end of the Edinburgh <laughs> Festival. <laughs> and you've, you've been busy, cos you've also written a book... Yeah. ..which is called The Problem With Men. Yes. So what's the book about? Well, it's trying to look at masculinity through this question, when's International Men's Day, and trying to work out um, what we need to do to, I guess, move masculinity into the 21st century and the ways that men are their own worst enemy, I think. Uh, and this, it was based on the thing I used to do on International Women's Day, where I noticed lots of men on International Women's Day would tweet, when's International Men's Day? Oh, there'd never be one, because the political correctness gone mad. That's not very equal, is it? But there is an International Men's Day, it's November the 19th. So I would just find everyone who asked that question and say it's November the 19th. But you, uh, but you found everyone. I found everyone, so I'd search everything, every misspelling, every bad apostrophe, because it's quite hard to get the apostrophes right on International Men's Day yeah. for some people. And it was finding every single person and then go over the course of the day, it turned into, again, this mad thing where it, I'd set myself this impossible task of trying to let everyone know. Yeah. I'm just answering their question. Uh, and so, again, it rebounds on me. It becomes a joke on me as well because I, I've, I can't possibly do it. And I did that for nine years. Yep. And this year, I kind of did it the last time and thought, right, I'm gonna, I want to put it to bed. That's, that's it. It's, I've had enough of it. And how do people respond? Well... Is it just bile? No, no, mainly it's great. OK, it? most people oh, love it. Most people... Most women love it because I'm trying to just shut up this kind of irritant. On, it's, it's like some, on your birthday, if I came to your birthday party and go, When's, when's my birthday? Why aren't, I, why aren't people giving me presents? It's, yeah. it's annoying. Which, weirdly, is, I think you probably do. <laughs> I would do. Because <laughs> you could probably get better presents than me. Uh, but So most women loved it. Some, uh, some women didn't like it. They felt I was making the day about myself. A lot of men's rights activists felt I was mocking International Men's Day, which I never really was. Yeah. But I think, men, having written this book... Uh, I wanted to look at it a bit more, starting from that idea, starting from why men ask that question and how and can we stop them asking that question and what it means, because actually it's bad for men because it makes us look bad. It's bad for International Men's Day 
because it make, makes international men's day look like a knee-jerk reaction, which it isn't. Mm. It makes it look like a misogynist thing, which it isn't. And it's bad for International Women's Day because, you know, so I'm just trying to corral it off on International Women's Day so everyone else can get on with their day. Now, the book sort of centres around lots of questions. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, can a man really be a feminist? Um, there's, and there's a chapter about uh, men think they could score a point against Serena Williams. Yeah. So this is, you know, that, that was the chapter, I think, that really turned the key for me in realising that, that there was more to it than this, because it's a similar question. People were asked a few years ago in a survey, if you were playing your best tennis, yeah. do you think you could take a point off Serena Williams? Yeah. And 12% of men said they definitely could. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. another 13% of men said they didn't know, which implies... Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, maybe they didn't know who Serena Williams was. I'm not sure. That, well, I'll find out who she is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even when, every time I mention this on Twitter, you'll get dozens of men saying, no, definitely, she would double fault. She'd, she'd double fault. And you go, you know she wouldn't yeah. double fault against you. Funny you should say that, because we've actually got footage of the, uh, the blokes playing tennis against Serena Williams. Oh, cool. Did you know the truth about <laughs> <laughs> And that, and look how slow. Yeah, that, she's not even that was hitting it hard. Oh, so yeah. slow. She serves at like something like 130 miles an hour in the big games. Yeah. That was probably 30 or 40 miles an hour, wasn't but it? But there's it's something about like there's a certain type of bloke that just backs himself. Like there was a, there was a. There was a poll that 62% of men say that they would take a punch from Mike Tyson <laughs> for 50 grand. It's just like, what? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, no, definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll just roll it. The overconfidence of men is, biz is so bizarre. Where right? do you think that comes from? Well, I think it's, we, you know, we can't admit... Men find it very difficult to admit... I'm very competitive, and I find it difficult to admit that I've made mistakes. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of in... You know, it's in us, because we've been told that we, we can't... We should... It's vul we're showing vulnerability if we yeah. cry or if we admit mistakes or if we think someone... If you look at Donald Trump and everything yeah. that's going on with Donald Trump, that's the archetype, isn't it? He won't admit he's lost because that's weakness. He won't admit he's vulnerable. He won't ever admit he's wrong about anything. And that's it, sort of personified. And actually... Men need to, need to realise that showing vulnerability is, a, a, not all the time, but some of the time, is a very attractive quality. It's a very admirable quality. To lose gracefully, um, to not have to be the best at everything, is, yep. is, it takes a lot of pressure off. The overconfidence helps men up to an extent. It helps them get jobs, and women have a more realistic view of their, their abilities. And in the job market, that can lead to men getting jobs that women, that they're not qualified. Mm. So it's... It's sort of interesting, but I think being, you know, show, being vulnerable... I mean, I think as comedians, we know it, but expressing yourself... Yeah. Exp you know, as a comedian, the big moments of me have been when I've told the most embarrassing stories possible or admitted to the bad things I've done. So if you... When I did the show Talking Cock, which is a sort of similar theme to The Problem With Men, you know, people would... I, I would talk about penile injuries and there was a thing about uh, snapping the banjo string. If you're, <laughs> if you're using friction, you can break the little bit at the top of your penis. And a, one guy, one day, a guy just came at, back into the auditorium pretending he'd lost his cigarettes, this big, muscly, tattooed guy, and said, oh, that bit about the banjo string, I thought that was the only... I thought that was the only one that had ever happened to. It's amazing to hear that talked about. And you could see him almost crying in tears coming in his eyes. No, he'd never even been felt... He could talk about that, and he thought because he was the only person that happened to Yeah. Him. So by doing a comedy about stuff is a good way of getting through to men. But also, you know, it's, it's just the honesty. It's, it's a good policy. Yeah, but you're completely right. It's sort of... And you don't have to be... The great thing about talking about things through, through comedy, yeah. you don't have to be pious or high and mighty about it. You can be ludicrous and stupid and yeah. you can go in, off in sideways directions. You don't have to be, this is the way that you should think. No, I think like people have to calm down a bit. It's, it's all about tribes and that's what this book is about as well. It's not kind of... It's called The Problem With Men, which does seem a bit like, oh, but it's about just making small shifts and talking to people and listening to people. And, you know, I'm not... You know, I'm not right about everything and I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions... Uh, but I think, you know, for me, if I could just do the one thing of just say, let's, let's just stop asking that question on, on one day. Mm. And little steps like that, it doesn't matter. You know, some people are, gonna, some people are always going to find criticisms mm. and that's just some people's MO, isn't it? Yeah. You sort of have to ignore it, but I do think we've, we're turning into tribes and it's not helpful, right? If we, if we want equality, yeah. if men want equality, if men's right activists want equality, women, feminists want equality as well, 
you want the same thing. <laughs> it's yeah. the same. Equality is the same. You can call it different things, but, but we're actually fighting for the same thing. So if women get equality, men get equality. You know, that's something that has to be looked at. Uh, and, and the Black Lives Matter thing was no more, you know, because that asking when's International Men's Day on International Women's Day is the marijuana that leads to the hard drug of asking, well, yeah. why don't white lives matter? Black lives matter doesn't mean white lives don't matter. It's, you know, it, it's very easy to understand what black lives matter means. It means all lives matter. Yeah. It's just saying black people are being prejudiced against in all these circumstances we've seen. And so for, to willfully misinterpret that or even believe that that's a, that's a really weird place to get to. Uh, and it's so easy to explain why that's a stupid position, why people go, when's white history month? Well, we, we don't need that because all of history is, all the history we're taught is of white people. We don't hear the mm. stories of the black people. So we have what, a month to try and slightly redress that massive imbalance. And so it's, it's not hard to explain these things. I think in the book, it's nice to, it's a short book. It's very quick and easy to read. And, and because I was forced to make it short, I had to really get my arguments, you know, very sharp and together. And I think it's really nice to see it just in black and white and explained. Mm. And, you know, all, my, all I want from it is the one thing, which is for men not to ask that question on one day. And, but I think if we can do that, you know, I think the dominoes might start to fall behind that as well, weirdly. That was fascinating. Thanks for coming on the show, Thank mate. Thank you. No, thanks Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Richard Herring! <laughs>